Acts 18. Let's take our Bible and open to Acts 18. If you don't have a Bible, we've provided one there close to you. You can take a pew Bible and turn to page 927, and you should be really close to Acts 18. Um, Before I get started preaching, I just want to say that I love my bride. That was her singing, by the way, and and, uh, and, uh, she was the one standing about right here. She's gorgeous. And uh, she's mine. She's mine. It's good to see you this morning. Um, got a message that I want to bring to you. I know it's from God. I needed it. And I pray that you'll find yourself listening and obeying this morning. I'm going to speak on encouraging the Christian or encouragement for the Christian. Um, Let me pray and we'll get started. Acts 18, page 927. Father, thank you for this day. God, thank you for the power of your Spirit. God, thank you for uh, the opportunity to open the book. God, thank you for the times that we're down in the valley. And God, you speak into our life. You remind us of the blessings of the day. The blessings of being your child. And God... You encourage us. I I know that there's been times in my life, many times, that you literally spiritually reached down and lifted my chin toward heaven. So today, God, I pray that encouragement by your word and your spirit will continue. I pray, God, that you would uh, take that person that is near giving up, uh, near quitting, uh, Lord, on their marriage or on their family or on... God, just being the person you've called them to be, and I pray, God, that you would call them out for your glory and you would encourage them today. God, I love you. I ask for your Spirit's empowerment. I am nothing without you, and I need you, God, every single minute. Forgive me, God. Wash me clean and fill me with your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I don't know if you heard this week, but a pastor, uh, a well-known pastor by the name of Jared Wilson, there's actually two Jared Wilsons, but one of them uh, is well known. He took his own life this past week. Well, was, I read it this morning in Christianity Today that um, I didn't even know it until today, but hours before he took his own life, he preached a, lady's, a young lady's funeral that took her own life. Guys, One of the things, you know, in counseling and and walking through life with you, one of the things I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's people here today that's discouraged. There's people here today, your heart feels like it's been ripped out of your chest. And you don't know what to do. Even the Apostle Paul struggled with discouragement. So, How could we be immune to discouragement? If men like Jared Wilson, and I want to go ahead and say this, men in position of leadership like pastors and teachers and fathers, and even women in leadership, we have a tendency to hide our hurt. To put it behind us and, and not really admit to it where God's Spirit maybe could come to us and comfort us and guide us. But I believe the first step to getting help from God is realizing you need it. Amen? Realizing that you need it. That God's Spirit will come to you if you say, God, I need you. So today, I want to encourage you with the Word. And I want to remind you of where Paul has been. Paul has been in Thessalonica, beaten and ran out of town. God has been in, I mean, uh, Paul has been in Philippi beaten and ran out of town and jailed, earthquake, all that story. He went down to Berea. The people from the other town came down and ran him out of Berea. He went to Athens. He didn't have a real successful ministry there as we would consider success because everybody there was highly educated and philosophers and they ran him out of town. And now he finds himself in in Corinth, which is basically sin city. I mean, it's sin city. It's... uh, The Acropolis is there, a thousand feet above the whole town of Corinth. Corinth sits on the isthmus of, it's a major trade route, so you got travelers coming through. 
Um, and they are basically entertained with a thousand slave prostitutes. Whenever these, these men come across this little narrow strip of land, it's just a totally ungodly place. And then Paul finds himself there in Corinth. And he, I, well, he, we know because whenever Paul wrote the letter to Corinth, he said, look, I'm here and I'm weak. I came to you in weakness and much fear and trembling. I was tired. I was ready to give up. But we see that Paul stays about 18 months in Corinth. Why? I mean, what if, other than Ephesus, it's the lo- longest place that he's ever stayed. Why? Well, you're about to see why. God encouraged him. God spoke to him. Let me read you a couple things that I have in my notes before we get to the Scripture. Everyone is subject to discouragement, even Paul. Amen? Everyone. Just think about the different sources that the Lord uses to encourage us. He uses the Scripture. I love it when that happens. He speaks to us just at the right time. Y'all ever had that happen? I mean, God knows what to say to you. He uses the Scripture. God uses Christian authors. I use different devotions like Oswald Chambers and David Jeremiah and Charles Spurgeon and Henry Blackaby, and God uses Christian authors to speak into our life to encourage us. God uses the saints like you and me. Look, some of y'all send me chocolate, and I want to tell you, you send it just at the right time. I mean, I just love it. God uses dear saints like you with notes and emails to encourage me. And same way with you. God uses His Spirit, His presence, You ever felt the presence of God? (laughs) You're talking about encouraging. And then God uses the Savior Himself. There's literally times, let me tell you something about Jesus, I literally feel like I can reach out and touch Him. You know what I'm talking about? Like the Spirit of God begins to minister to you and Jesus is there and the power of the Holy Spirit and you feel like you could just reach out there and touch Jesus. There was a time this morning that I was worshiping God. I closed my eyes and for just a moment you disappeared and all I could see in my spiritual eyes is God. He walked on the water. He was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they did not get burned. He spoke to the sea, and it obeyed him. Charles Spurgeon said, look, he he reminded his congregation, and I remind you, Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher, but he reminded his congregation quite often, he said, by perseverance, even the snail reached the ark. (laughs) Don't give up. Stop thinking about giving up. Another professor at Wheaton College said, look, it's always too soon to give up. It's always too soon to give up. Paul is alone in Corinth. He's tired. He's weak. He's maybe even sick. He's, he always talks about the thorn in the flesh. Corinth is a major trade route. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul said these words, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. But the God, but he basically goes on in that letter to say the God of all comfort, who comforts and, and, and brings about that brought me out of that depression. And God did it by three things that I want to show you this morning. Number one, he used Christian friends. He used Christian friends, and he used fruit from Paul's labor, and then he used, um, basically he used fellowship. He used himself, he used fellowship with him to encourage Paul. Now, I think for this sermon to make any sense to you whatsoever, you have to evaluate yourself. You have to stop and say, are you discouraged? Are you, think about, are you thinking about giving up on church, giving up on your marriage, giving up on your family, giving up on your Christian walk? You're tired. Well, let me tell you how Paul or how God encouraged Paul. Number one, he used 
friends in the ministry. He used friends in the ministry. Let's look in the first five verses. Now after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth about 50 miles. And he found a Jew. These, I love the book of Acts. It's got some really weird names in it. <laughs> he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Aquila and a Priscilla. How do you like that one? Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. What had happened in Rome, there had been an edict around 49 to 50 A.D., and the Christians and the Jews were fighting among themselves, and he said, look, all the Jews just leave Rome. And that's why Aquila and Priscilla left Rome and found themselves in Corinth. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, I want to stop right there. Now I want to say the first thing God used in the Apostle Paul's life, he sent friends like Aquila and Priscilla and Timothy and Silas in Paul's life at the right time to encourage this brother. Do y'all have friends in the ministry? Do y'all have friends in life? I want to tell you something, there's nothing better whenever you're feeling down and God sends a friend beside you. And look, not only was it a friend, but it was a friend who worked, that did the same thing for a living. They were all tent makers. So they stayed together, and I, we don't really know when Aquila, uh, Aquila and Priscilla were converted, but that's not really told in Scripture, but I believe it was before this. And they got together, and they made tents, and they talked about Jesus. I love it. When God uses the right people at the right time to encourage us. This past weekend, the pastors and our, our spouses had a time to, to get away across the bay over there. And I want to just tell you something. God used this weekend to encourage this brother. God used my friends in the ministry to pray with me. To look at the Word together. To talk about the, the future. To eat together. Guys, I want to just tell you something. God uses friends in the ministry. Praise God. Do you have one? The Lord knows, and the Lord uses workers like Aquila and Priscilla. He uses new worshipers like Justice and, and uh, Crispus to encourage. God knew Paul needed someone to be his friend, and he sent, he sent him a friend just in time. Paul found a friend. It was a husband and wife team who had become a close friend for a long period of time. The Bible does not tell us again where these two, when these two recorded. But what's amazing to notice is God saw that he needed friends and he sent him two friends and then he sent him two more friends with uh, Timothy and Silas. So let me say this really quickly. God used fellow workers, which is... Aquila and Priscilla, and then God used familiar friends, which is Timothy and Silas. Let me read you a story that um, Warren Wearsby tells about quitting. And I, Look, there's somebody here that's ready to quit, and I, I came to tell you about God's Word. It's, it's always too soon to quit. Listen to this, and I know what's stubbornly. You know, I, when I moved to Vermont, I thought snow was the best thing since sliced bread for about the first three times it snowed. It's aggravating. It adds an hour to your day. If it snows three to six inches, it adds an hour to your day because you've got to shovel your way out of it. Anyone, anyone, Warren Wearsby said, can go through tough times of discouragement. Warren Wearsby tells the story of a man shoveling snow uh, from his driveway when two boys carrying snow shovels approached him. Snow, uh, shovel your snow, mister, one of the, the, the boys asked, only two dollars. Puzzled, the man replied, can't you see that I'm doing it myself? Sure, said the enterprising, the little, he, he had his own business. Lad said, that's why we asked. We get most of our business from people that's about halfway through and they feel like quitting. They walk around, they, I want to tell you something, it can be, this, no, this is not in the Bible, but I want to tell you it's true, it can be 10 below outside, and you can dress just casually, and you can go out and start shoveling snow and sweat like crazy. 
Shoveling snow is work. And, and I can't tell you how many times I just felt like just driving on it. Just giving up. And these lads would come by and say, look, we get half of our business from people that feel like quitting. And I believe a lot of people in here today feel like quitting, but I want to tell you something, don't. Don't. Look at who God's placing around you. Look at where God has you today with the message that's being applied to your life today. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, whenever I was among you, I felt weak. But God sent a friend. God sent a friend right at the right time. Number two, he also sent fruit for his labor. God did. Look in the last part of verse 5 all the way to 8. Paul, look at this. Y'all know what I want to be occupied with? Y'all know what I'm usually occupied with? Eating, sleeping, and breathing. But I want to tell you something. I want to be occupied with the Word of God. Do you see? I love it whenever it says Paul was occupied with the Word. Look in verse 5. Paul was occupied with the Word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. We have one message to tell, and it should occupy our life, and people should say this, look, that guy was occupied with telling people that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. You will not go to heaven without Him. You must be born again. You must confess your sin. You don't need to be religious. You need to be born again. You must be born again. And when they opposed him, and I want to go ahead and remind you of the history. He's been beaten beyond measure. He's been ran out of town. Now his buddies, his buddies just came to him, but they've been away from him. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. So he went into the synagogue, and he was reasoning with them, and he said, look, this is man's responsibility right here. Your blood be upon your own heads if you don't believe. You know what? I've got to repeat, Paul. Say today God reveals to you that you're not saved and you need to be born again. Everybody listening to me, say amen. amen. And you don't confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your blood be upon your own head. I love you. But you must be born again. Do y'all remember what the religious people were shouting whenever they were shouting, crucify Him, crucify Him? He said, they even said, let His blood be upon us and our children. Let, let His blood be, let it, the guilt, I will take the guilt. Guys, I want to just tell you something. Right then, we would have give up. We'd have said, I want to go home. But look what Paul did. I love this. He left there. Look, I'm in verse 7. He left there and went to the house of a man named Titius. Justice. A worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. I love this. Golly, I love it. God's word is good. Jesus is Lord and there is no other. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Listen to this. All right. Picture this. Picture you. Picture you walking into a church building, a synagogue, and nobody's listening to you, and you get run out of town. Are you going to go next door? <laughs> he went right next door and started preaching the, the gospel. He didn't give up. And God gave him fruit for his labor. God gave him fruit for his labor. Let's read verse 8. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed. So the actual ruler of the synagogue, and i got to fast forward and tell you this, I, sometimes I just go crazy. Listen to me. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, the Jew, got saved here. And I believe Solosthenes, who would actually take the place of Crispus later on in the story, I believe he gets saved because whenever you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1, it says Paul and Solosthenes are brother. He's actually writing the letter back to Corinth with the ruler of the synagogue, the second ruler of the synagogue that got saved. That is fruit for our labor. I want to just tell you something. We don't serve the Lord in vain. You do not do what's right in vain. God sees it and God will reward it. Don't give up. 
Stop even thinking about giving up. The ruler of the synagogue believed in the Lord together with his entire, I forgot to mention, his whole household was saved. His entire household and many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. Now, let me, let me say something really quickly. Paul and Silas brought gifts from the Macedonians to Paul at this time. This allowed Paul to stop tent making and minister full time because in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 9 it says this. He says, whenever I was present with you in need, I was not a burden to no one for I did not lack, for, for what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you and so I will keep myself. By Paul making this statement, your blood be upon your own heads, he was saying that their responsibility, he was not even taking a salary from them at this time because the churches at Macedonia was supplying his need and he was tent making. He said, literally, your blood is going to be upon your own heads. Crispus, the Jew, and his whole household was saved. He was a Jew. Justice, the Gentile, was saved. It's just amazing to see what perseverance brings. Paul never give up. He never stopped. And he, you see this constantly. People were believing and being baptized. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you something. I struggled sometimes, or I struggle a little bit with this sermon, because I realize there's times whenever you're depressed and you're discouraged and that you, you may feel alone and you don't have a friend. But I want to just tell you something. God can bring a friend at the right time. He's did it in my life, and I know He can do it in your life. Now, I know there's also times that you look around at your, your hard work, your teaching, your discipleship, and you say, I don't see fruit from my labor, but you need to keep on keeping on. Amen? But this last point, I promise you, will happen. The first two are... I don't want to say maybes. I can say they happen in Paul's life. They happen at the right time, at the right place, and God's just on time every time. But this last one that I'm going to bring up, the way God encouraged Paul, I believe, is the most important, and I can promise you it will happen. And this is God Himself coming to you and encouraging you. God Himself coming to you and encouraging you. Look with me in 9 through 17. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision. See, he's, again, he's probably thinking about Thessalonica. He's thinking about Philippi. He's thinking about Berea. He's thinking about just going back home to Jerusalem. And then you get to verse number 9, and it says, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. Now, i gotta, I got to preach on something really quickly if you all allow me. Everybody still with me? Say amen. Pastor, what does that mean, I have many people in this city? Well, you know what it means? He had many people in that city that God needed to get the gospel to so they could be saved. And God knew who they were. That's the perfect definition of election and predestination that's taught in the Bible. You say, Pastor, don't you believe in man's responsibility? Yeah, that's why I pointed out a while ago that Paul said, your blood be upon your own heads. It goes hand in hand. Praise God. Look, God chose me. I didn't get smart one day and choose God. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? I just know that I believe in the sovereignty of God's will in man's responsibility. Whosoever will. You know, whenever you walk through heaven, here's what it's going to be like. It's what I dream it's going to be like. When you walk through, on the front side, it's going to say, on the front side of the gate, it's going to be whosoever will. When you walk through the back gate, and you, I mean, you walk through the front gate and you look back, it says whosoever was chosen. I can't explain it. I believe in both of them. Things, look, things are just hard to understand sometimes, but it is amazing to me, and I'm not going to skip over this, that God could already say, Paul, I have a lot of people in this city. Y'all looking at me like you don't believe me. That's amazing, isn't it? Paul, you're going to stay there a year, about a year and eight months, 
And I'm going to direct you to the right people that I'm working on, that I'm drawing to myself. They've got to, they've got to repent and they've got to follow me. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's fruit. You see the sovereign purpose of God. God is in control of all of this. So, let's keep reading. And he stayed about a year and six months after this, and I believe he'd already been there about about two months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was uh, proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made an attack, a united attack on Paul, and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul opened was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words or names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be the judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And this is crazy. They seized Sosthenes. That was the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him up. The Jews did the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to all any of this. So, all right, what happened was the first ruler of the synagogue got saved. His name was Crispus. He got saved. Now, evidently, Sosthenes took his place as ruler of the synagogue. Now, they were trying to get rid of Paul because he was Second Baptist Church right next door and people were actually getting saved there. So they were trying to get rid of Paul. So they brought him before the council, and he, Sosthenes didn't have a good case, and they got refused by the council, so the Jews got mad at the leader and beat him up. And you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you don't have to look there now, but you can look there later, chapter 1, verse 1, and you see the same name mentioned with Paul as a brother in the Lord. My friend, I want to just tell you something, that is amazing to me. Now, what we're talking about is fellowship with God. The Lord has provided the most encouragement to Paul when he came to him in a vision and he said, Paul, I'm right here. I'm with you. The Lord himself said to Paul. Nobody else said it. The Lord said it. The Word of God comforts us. When God speaks, my friend, it is nothing better than when God speaks. The vision came at a crucial point in Paul's life. The Lord's encouraging words to Paul was, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. The the vision gave four reasons for him not to give up. Number one, the message must be told. Go on speaking. The power of the presence of God, I am with you. Tell me one thing better than the simple fact of God saying, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. God is with us. Number three, God's protection. No one will attack you. And in God's salvation, I have many people in this city. With his strength fully renewed, Paul settled down in Corinth. And and another year and six months came, came by. Now let's look at the Great Commission and see how this applies to the Great Commission if we could. Everybody still with me? Say amen. What does God say in the Great Commission? Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now let's ask the right questions really quickly. Did Paul go? I'm going to ask that again. Did Paul go? Yes. Did he make disciples? Yes. Did Paul baptize people? Yes. Did Paul teach people about Jesus? Yes. Now i got one more question to ask you. Was the Lord with Paul? Yes. <laughs> Look, everybody here is subject to discouragement. Everybody here. Even the Apostle Paul. But God spoke into his life and said, Look, you may feel like I've been somewhere and I've left you, but I've never went anywhere. In the ministry, number two, fruit for his labor, from from our labor, and then fellowship with God. I love verse 9 and 10. Do not be afraid. Go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you. 
I'm with you, Paul, and no one will attack you. For I have many in this city who are my people. What do y'all think was going through Paul's mind when he thought about quitting? Can I give you some suggestions? Nobody likes me. I get beat up everywhere I go. I've walked out of a room like that, haven't you? You walk out and say, man, I, what am I doing? Paul probably felt so alone. I, I think about the Apostle Paul, maybe this is too descriptive, but you've got to understand something about the Apostle Paul. Those thousand temple prostitutes that would come down off the Acropolis, their job, they were slaves to their love, the goddess of love. And they would recruit men to practice in their worship. So think about this. The, whole, the, the man, the Apostle Paul, was walking around in a sin city like Corinth with these type people walking around him with nobody listening to him and people wanting to beat him up. Think about the discouragement that he had. He said, I was with you and I was weak and I was fearful, and I had much trembling. And that's when God sent Aquila and Priscilla to be his friends in the ministry. That's when God showed up and started giving him fruit for his labor. He said, don't go anywhere. I have many people in this city. And that's when God gave him a vision and said, Paul, I'm right here, son. I'm right here. I'm right here. God, thank you for being right here with us. Today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I want to ask you to give your life to Him. I want to ask you to walk this aisle in humility, saying, Pastor, I need to take Jesus at His promise. Whosoever will, you can trust God. If you confess your sin, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Come and give your life to Jesus Christ today. Christian, if you're discouraged, come and kneel at the altar and say, God, encourage me. God, remind me, give give me a vision like Paul had. Let's pray together. Father.